Hi, everybody, and welcome to our second installment of the Radical Philosophy Hour. Uh, we're so happy that you're able to join us here on Facebook Live uh, for another edition. And uh, today we'll be hearing from two great philosophers we have with us today, uh, Jeff Gower and Rick Elmore. Um, and they'll both be sort of dealing with questions of the relationship between theory and praxis. So this should be a really nice and exciting conversation. Uh, before I turn it over uh, and, and move along to our, our first talk, I do wanna point out to everybody that we'll be continuing this Radical Philosophy Hour um, next month on June 7th. So the first Monday of every month, be looking for a new installment of the Radical Philosophy Hour with uh, Jason Reed, who will be uh, giving a talk on preemptive strikes of a philosophical variety, Marx and Spinoza, as well as Ashley Bohr, who will be talking about how is it to be done, dilemmas of prefigurative and harm reduction approaches to social movement work. So we look forward to those excellent and exciting talks uh, upcoming in June. And with that, let's go ahead and get started with today's uh, discussion, which again, promises to be just really exciting. Um, so we'll start then with Jeff Gower's talk, What is Practice Beyond the Theory Practice Pair? Jeff Gower is teaching um, and has research interests um, that focus on continental philosophy, political philosophy, environmental philosophy, and political economy. He received his PhD from Villanova University and is Byron K. Trippett, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Wabash College with teaching duties in philosophy and PPE. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Jeff. Thanks so much. Hey, Brandon, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my screen uh, so y'all are able to see my slides. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to dive right in uh, so that I don't overflow uh, my time limit. Uh, in the seminar theory and practice, Derrida develops a line of inquiry about the edge distinguishing theory from practice, uh, an edge that possibly would presumably overflow as it ceases to merely interpret the world and begins to change it. In readings of Marx's 11 thesis on Feuerbach and its reception by Gramsci and Althusser, Derrida investigates the impasses that arise and the transformations that theory, as it is determined in the metaphysical tradition as sovereign over practice, uh, would have to undergo to resolve or dissolve itself into practical activity. When Derrida extends this line of inquiry into readings of Heidegger's letter on humanism, science and reflection, and the question concerning technology, it becomes evident that theory and practice alike remain bound to metaphysical determinations as long as practice is thought in terms of the theory of practice pair. Tracing Derrida's line of inquiry today, uh, I will attempt to explain uh, how this metaphysical over-determination of theory and practice makes it difficult to articulate or even to recognize a practice free from metaphysical over-determination. Uh, and I hope that this uh, invites discussion about practices capable of overflowing not merely the metaphysical prioritization of theory, but the theory-practice pair. So I'm going to uh, outline uh, a, a sort of very skeletal version of Derrida's itinerary in theory and practice, uh, saying uh, just a very few things about Gramsci and Althusser, uh, and focusing the weight of my attention uh, on Heidegger and his treatment of Heidegger, uh, and uh, try to suggest uh, or try to point to a couple of practices uh, that might uh, offer um, some sort of food for thought uh, think practice outside of the metaphysically overdetermined theory practice pair. Uh, so Derrida's itinerary begins uh, in the seminar uh, with uh, Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach. Uh, Fame alluded to in my introductory remarks, right? The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Die Philosophen haben die Welt nur verschieden interpretiert. Es kommt darauf an, sie zu verändern. My question is going to be like, what happens uh, in uh, the shift from the first clause to the second clause? What happens with the semicolon in the English translation? Uh, Derrida notes that uh, Marx's thesis uh, implicates the whole of the history of philosophy in what Derrida calls theoreticism. Uh, Derrida says uh, the crit critique addresses Feuerbach, uh, but it implicates everything in the history of philosophy that places the 
hereticist attitude over and above the practical, seeing in the former the authentic supreme human accomplishment, implicating, that is to say, perhaps the quasi-totality of philosophy from Plato, Aristotle uh, to Kant. Uh, Kant is a little bit uh, murky, but I'll leave that suspended for now. Uh, so this idea of theoreticism or the traditional uh, metaphysical uh, assertion of the sovereignty of theory over practice is called into question by the 11th thesis on Feuerbach, uh, but the way in which it's called into question remains ambiguous. Um, as Derrida uh, points out, um, let's see. what this could mean and what it has often been taken to mean is something like the end of philosophy. Uh, once again, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. So as I mentioned before, what happens in this shift between the first and second clause, uh, which Derrida refers to throughout the seminar as the event of the 11th thesis, uh, the questions are, uh, is philosophy resolved or dissolved into or even consummated in practical activity? Does philosophy somehow go away uh, as um, practical activity begins to change the world and seems to be satisfied with interpreting it? Or on the other hand, is philosophy maintained in a way that has been transformed through practical revolutionary activity? As Derrida puts it, uh, does the last thesis remark, remark the end of philosophy, which would have been satisfied with interpreting, or the end of only the philosophy that is satisfied with interpreting, so that what Marx calls for would still be a philosophy, but a philosophy that transforms the world, a practical revolutionary philosophy. In short, in the first case, Marx would be calling for a general revolutionary practice and a revolutionary theory practice that would no longer belong to the order of philosophy, essentially overflowing the philosophical as such, in the second, he would be calling for a practical revolutionary transformation of philosophy, but without rejecting it, suppressing, seeming, destroying the philosophical. Uh, so this motif of overflowing uh, is a recurring motif in the readings of Althusser uh, and Heidegger uh, that uh, Derrida, Derrida returns to uh, over and over, uh, introduced here uh, as the overflowing of theory into practice. Right, as philosophy uh, is resolved into practice. Uh, but as we'll see, uh, that overflowing and the edge over which the flowing moves uh, is going to shift uh, so that uh, overflowing uh, ends up referring to an overflowing beyond philosophy itself in every attempt to reinscribe philosophy uh, within practical revolutionary activity. Uh, this edge that I just referred to uh, emerges uh, right at the beginning in the first session of Theory and Practice, uh, where Derrida marks two reference points uh, that he's going to uh, uh, use uh, to, to, to raise this question of what he calls the edge. Um, the first is Gramsci, uh, which he treats very uh, briefly. And I'm just going to gloss over this. Uh, my understanding of what he does with Gramsci is just uh, to show how uh, in a response to Croce, uh, who thinks that philosophy does disappear in the event of the 11th thesis, that philosophy does uh, overflow into and then become resolved into or dissolved into practice. Gramsci tries to recuperate, uh, reassert uh, philosophy by recruiting, recuperating practice back into philosophy, affirming the unity of theory and practice. Uh, Althusser Heidegger occupies uh, most of the attention uh, in the remaining sessions, uh, although uh, there's substantial discussion of Kant as well. Um, and that uh, is, is more, uh, a more complex picture. Uh, what Derrida says toward the end of the first session is that he's interested in structural analogies uh, concerning the effects of, quote, this edging, this intricate structure, always exemplarily so concerning theory practice. So uh, just to reiterate it, we're concerned with it with two edges. First of all, uh, the edge uh, dividing theory and practice uh, that is the site of a certain kind of overflowing. And then second, uh, the edge uh, of theory practice as it's philosophically or metaphysically understood, uh, the edge of philosophy itself, right? And thus the question of the edge raises the question of the end of philosophy. 
Uh, this notion of the edge of philosophy uh, is formulated uh, as Derrida turns to his reading of Althusser uh, saying, uh, for me, it is about posing the question of what happens in philosophy on the inner edge of philosophy when one endows the theory practice pair with major functions as Marxist practical theoretical philosophy does today. Uh, so what happens in philosophy or on the inner edge of philosophy uh, when uh, philosophy makes itself concerned with this edge marking the distinction between theory and practice? Uh, and my uh, guiding insight here, my, my attempt to interpret what Derrida is doing in theory and practice uh, is that what happens to philosophy is it loses control of its borders, right? as is often the case with Derrida's readings. Uh, when, Derrida, when, when philosophy introduces the edge dividing theory and practice into its own discourse, uh, uh, then its own attempt to gain mastery over itself, its own attempt to assert uh, the boundaries uh, of its own uh, discourse or to divide the philosophical uh, from the other than philosophical uh, gets out of control. Um, so Derrida says that uh, this edge of theory and practice uh, is prominent in Marx's discourse uh, today. Uh, so um, speaking of today, uh, I turn to his reading uh, of Althusser's uh, introduction to four Marx, uh, which is sort of his entree into the reading of Althusser. I won't get into uh, the more detailed readings uh, of uh, the, and the like essays like uh, On the Materials Dialectic, uh, or his reply to John Lewis uh, or uh, other uh, Althusser texts uh, that he cites uh, just in the interest of time. I'm gonna leave that uh, to someone who knows more about it, who's speaking right after me, uh, I'll leave that to Rick Elmore. Uh, but I just wanna mark a few things uh, to follow this, this itinerary. Um, so reading for the introduction of four marks called today, uh, Derrida marks the affirmation of Hereticism or of the sovereignty of theory over practice in Althusser's discourse. And I just want to touch on a couple of ways in which Derrida marks that. Uh, so first of all, uh, he notes that in that introduction, uh, Althusser um, seems to dismiss uh, or, or mitigate uh, the importance of the 11th thesis uh, precisely because it seems to affirm a certain kind of practicism. Uh, in fact, uh, it affirms on Althusser's terms a, a pragmatism, uh, such that the the truth would be whatever uh, is whatever works, whatever emerges out of a re practical revolutionary activity. Uh, Althusser wants to resist that, uh, and so uh, he wants to reassert uh, the sovereignty of theory over practice. Uh, which he gets in the 11th thesis, which uh, references not merely practical activity, but also the conceptualization, the greifen of that practical uh, activity. And so the 8th thesis uh, and privileging the 8th thesis gives uh, Althusser a technical basis to reassert uh, the, the, the sovereign, what I'm calling the sovereignty of practice. Um, Derrida's reading, and again, I can't go through all the details here, but uh, shows how theory is the tribunal in which uh, the philosophical character of Marxist philosophy and Althusser's sense is adjudicated and separated uh, from ideology or from pre-scientific philosophy. Uh, and philosophy uh, is, and Marxist philosophy in particular is understood in what Derrida calls self-responsibility, what Althusser analyzes as a circular dialectic uh, through which uh, philosophy uh, as uh, dialectical materialism or historical materialism asserts itself and tests itself in this assertion as philosophy, uh, which uh, in On the Materialist Dialectic, Althusser calls theory with capital T and distinguishes from pre-scientific philosophy uh, or ideology. So I, I read this as, and, and Rick might have some things to say about whether this is a fair reading of Althusser, but I read that I read Derrida as saying what Althusser is trying to do uh, is to um, assert uh, the, uh, the, the, the theory, the general theory with a capital T um, as sort of the science of sciences or the sovereign science, right? The science that's able to give itself the ground or posit, it, it, posit itself uh, as uh, the organizing principle and, and um, an ultimate arbiter uh, 
of the philosophical character of philosophy. What happens to this, and Derrida shows this uh, throughout, through reading uh, detailed readings of other texts, uh, is uh, that sort of ma attempt to master uh, through self-assertion, attempt to master uh, uh, philosophy or what can count as philosophy and what can count uh, as revolutionary practice right, through the self-assertion of theory uh, gets out of control, right? So it overflows the boundaries that it posits. Derrida puts this on 71 as follows. Uh, the overflowing of a philosophy by another, uh, the overflowing of philosophy by a thinking that is no longer simply philosophical. Such an overflowing is the essential trait, but is discourse theory or practice uh, on the theory practice relation. Althusserian definition of the Marxist practice of philosophy intends to overflow not only the other philosophy, the whole history of philosophy, thus able to be interpreted or transformed on the basis of sides taken in class struggle. Instead, it intends also to overflow the philosophical as such, once that is defined and even situated uh, on a field, uh, for example, that of the class struggle that it doesn't control uh, and which is far from being reduced uh, to its philosophical instance. Uh, so for example, Althusser uh, is sort of compelled in the reply to John Lewis uh, to uh, criticize himself uh, for the theoreticism um, theoretical indulgence uh, uh, in his earlier works of taking back the strong theoreticism of, on the materialist dialectic. Uh, it, as soon as uh, theory with a capital T attempts to sort of master uh, practice and theoretical practice uh, as say, emphasizing its rationality or using rationality as a criterion, uh, practice, uh, shows up with other things uh, and, and uh, theory, uh, it gets out of the, the hands of theory. So this reference to a thinking that overflows philosophy, um, that overflows the bounds of philosophy uh, is I think a reference to Heidegger uh, and uh, that in Heidegger's affirmation of the thinking um, that takes place after the end of philosophy. Um, so finally, or, uh, yeah, nearing the end of the overflowing of philosophy by a thinking. Um, so the, the analogy that Derrida uh, mentioned between Althusser's, uh, the, the impasses that arise when one considers the edge and the overflowing of the edge in Althusser, and one, when one considers the edge and the overflowing of the edge in Heidegger, uh, are traced throughout readings of the essence uh, concerning technology, uh, science, and reflection, in the letter on humanism. Um, here, I'm actually gonna focus on a, a comment on Heidegger's essence of truth uh, that Derrida uses to introduce his reading of the question concerning technology, uh, where uh, Derrida uh, sort of most clearly articulates this problem of the edge and an overflowing in Heidegger. Uh, he says, uh, in, con in constructing his path as that of a return toward an initial sense, doesn't Heidegger presume, doesn't he repeat the philosophical here, techno-metaphysical presumption of the semantic unity of the field, of the philosophical continuum that clearly presumes a condition of mastery? In other words, doesn't the questioning concerning Richtigkeit, correctness, submit to the very injunction of what is questioned? Doesn't it repeat more or less oddly the very thing that is, it is questioning? Doesn't this Heideggerian type of question seemingly pose from the edge of the philosophical uh, in concerning the history of philosophy as a whole, uh, aim at ensuring mastery of a technical type over techno metaphysics so that it does no more than make that project develop and proliferate. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, right, in Heidegger's attempt to delimit uh, the history of philosophy or metaphysics as a whole as techno scientific mastery of the earth. Uh, and as calculative, the calculative thinking that uh, demands that techno-scientific mastery of the earth. Uh, Heidegger is himself involved in a gesture of techno-scientific mastery, attempting to master the totality of metaphysics, even if only to set it aside uh, for the sake of a thinking that would overflow or transcend or move beyond it. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm just gonna try to draw uh, the uh, the analogies um, in a very rough uh, form uh, that I mentioned at the outset. 
uh, and these are sort of hypotheses. Uh, so what are the impasses that Althusser and Heidegger run up against uh, when uh, they attempt to, when they introduce uh, the theory practice pair into their philosophy? Uh, what happens on the inner edge of philosophy? Uh, so I would say uh, just glossing uh, a lot of detailed analyses in Derrida's theory and practice, that for Althusser, the attempt to assert the self-responsibility of Marxist philosophy uh, as capital T theory, theory uh, overflows in the direction of a practice. Practice is the thing uh, that uh, theory can control and always has to be responding to, even if there's this gesture of theoreticism or this impetus toward theoreticism uh, in Althusser's thinking. Uh, for Heidegger, uh, attempts to delimit philosophy as techno-scientific mastery reproduces the gesture of mastery that it seeks to surpass. Uh, so in both of these, but in different ways, uh, there's uh, an, uh, uh, an overflowing that frustrates uh, the ability to articulate uh, the edge uh, that would mark the sort of ingress from uh, philosophy towards something like a, prax a praxis, making it seem impossible to actually take egress from this metaphysical determination of not only theory in its traditional priority over praxis, uh, but of the whole theory practice pair. So just very briefly uh, at the outset, uh, I'll point to uh, the work uh, of uh, Tris Trish Glazebrook and Matt Story uh, to suggest uh, that there is indeed practice outside of the theory practice pair. In their article, Heidegger and International Development, they point to women's subsistence agriculture in the global south as a possibility uh, of a practice uh, that avoids the impasses that uh, Derrida locates in Althusser and Heidegger um, because uh, of a few reasons, um, because it emerges uh, neither inside nor outside uh, the, the dominating power of techno-scientific mastery, uh, and because it's one of many and necessarily multiple sites of emergence, uh, I refer you to the enigmatic fraction of community uh, that Derrida uh, utters in his reading of Heidegger. Uh, with that, I'm gonna come to a close, thanks. Oh, and let me... Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that uh, discussion, for that talk. That was, gives a lot to think about. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn us over to Rick. And Rick will be following up, and we're going to hear um, quite a bit more on, 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 the same on the same subject. So hopefully, we can get a really deep understanding today. Um, Rick Elmore is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Appalachian State University. He researches and teaches in 20th century French philosophy, critical theory, social political philosophy, environmental philosophy, McCarthy studies, and new realisms. His articles and essays have appeared in Politics and Policy, Symploque, uh, Symposium, Mississippi Quarterly, the Cormac McCarthy Journal, the Edinburgh Companion to Animal Studies, and the Aesthetic Ground of Critical Theory, among others. Um, and he'll be talking to us about theory, praxis, and the absence of the commodity form, Derrida reading Althusser. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Rick. Thanks so much. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Does that look right? Do you see my presentation? Is that a yes and no? Maybe. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So thanks so much. And I wanted to thank uh, Sarah and, and Brandon for the invitation to come and talk. And it's great to be on a panel with Jeff again. It's been a couple of years since we've done that. And it makes me feel like the world might be coming back or something. Um, let's not get overly optimistic, though. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a part of an ongoing book chapter that I'm working on. And it's schematic. And, and I'm going to make some assertions that I'm not sure I'm actually committed to entirely. But I think that will be a fun place to, to discuss. And, and really, the, the impetus for this is that when I was reading the theory and practice lectures, there were things about Derrida's critique of Althusser that, that seemed off to me. And part of the project was try to sort of figure out what, what it is about them that was off um, with the hope that then this would reveal something about Derrida's relationship to Marx and sort of thinking about Derridian politics in, in a uh, sort of uh, 
in a Marxist vein, what that would look like, et cetera. So uh, I'll just begin. Um, do I sound okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, in his lectures on theory and practice, uh, Derrida critiques the work of uh, Louis Althusser and the discourses of Marxism more generally for what he sees as their problematic attempt to deal with the question of theory and practice. And we've already heard some about uh, uh, the sort of overarching schematics of, of how Derrida does this from Jeff's presentation. So I'm gonna try to just get to the heart of what I'm most interested in. So in the midst of this critique, uh, Derrida quotes a rather long passage from the Elements of Self-Criticism, 1974, that nicely summarizes the entire thrust, or at least I think the entire thrust of, of Althusser's critique. And that's on the screen, and I apologize for a giant block of text, but it's, it's a beautiful passage. So, one has only to open a textbook of law or jurisprudence to see clearly that law, which uniquely works as one with ideology, is in the last instance, and usually surprisingly transparently, the basis of all bourgeois ideology. One needs a Marxist lawyer to demonstrate it and a Marxist philosopher to understand it. As far as philosophers in general are concerned, they have not yet cut through the fog that surrounds them, and they hardly suspect the presence of law and legal ideology in their ruminations, in philosophy itself. However, the evidence is there. The dominant classical bourgeois philosophy is built on legal ideology, and its philosophical objects are legal categories or entities, the subject, the object, liberty, free will, property, representation, person, thing, etc. But those thinkers, those Marxists who have recognized the bourgeois char legal character of these categories and who criticize them must still find their way out of the trap of traps, the idea and program of a theory of knowledge. This is the keystone of classical bourgeois philosophy. Now, unless like Lenin and Mao, we use this expression in a context that indicates where to get out of the circle in the philosophical rather than the scientific sense, then the idea of a bourgeois theory of knowledge may be taken as constitutive of philosophy and even Marxist philosophy, and you remain caught in bourgeois ideology's trap of traps. For Althusser, the challenges facing the development of a truly Marxist philosophy are twofold. First, Marxist philosophers must recognize the bourgeois character of philosophy's existing definitions and concepts, the way in which under capitalist social relations, the very notion of the subject, object, property, et cetera, take on and reflect inherently bourgeois values and commitments. If all co concepts emerge and develop from sp specific material conditions, as every form of materialism asserts, then concepts are in some significant sense also a reflection of those material conditions. In the case of modern concepts, this means recognizing the way in which concepts reflect the material and ideological forces of capitalism. It means recognizing, quote, the presence of law and legal ideology in philosophy itself, which is to say the presence of bourgeois ideology in philosophy itself. This is a recognition that Althusser contends philosophers in general have yet to make. However, even Marxist philosophers, even for Marxist philosophers, this recognition alone is not enough. Marxist philosophers must, Althusser stresses, go further, critiquing not simply the bourgeois character of modern philosophy's concepts, but the very idea and program of a theory of knowledge as such. In a world in which every concept reflects the historically contingent social relations in which they develop and circulate, so too, the relationship between concepts and the very systematicity of our thinking what it means to be systematic itself, for example, also reflects certain social conditions and relations. Althusser's point here is not that we ought to abandon systematicity or systematic thinking, or that systematic thinking is inherently bourgeois or bad. Rather, his point is that Marxist philosophers, including himself, have not been systematic enough in the sense of following out the historically contingent nature of all concepts of thought, or all aspects of thought. They have remained content to critique the bourgeois nature of concepts without rejecting bourgeois philosophy's theory of knowledge as such. And I take this to be the fundamental claim of Althusser's period of self-criticism, right? He's recognizing his own dogmatism. For Althusser, the bourgeois trap of traps amounts to an insistence that some aspects of our thought cannot be fundamentally different than they are. The insistence that our trappedness within certain ways of thinking implies our trappedness within the social conditions those ways of thinking reflect. This is, he says, the keystone of classical bourgeois philosophy, the naturalization of bourgeois, philo bourgeois philosophy's theory of knowledge, the primary means for the naturalization of existing conditions of bourgeois life. In order to avoid this trap, Marxist thought must insist on the fundamentally dynamic, read necessarily historical, nature of all theoretical practice, that theoretical practice is always changing and changeable. Hence, there is at the heart of Althusser's thought 
a profound warning against the tendency towards the equivocation of thinking under certain social conditions with thinking in general. Right? Now, in just a second, I want to argue that Derrida seems to engage in this very kind of equivocation in his reading of Althusser. So he equivocates a general critique of uh, 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 Althusser's critique of bourgeois philosophy as a general critique of philosophy as such. And I think that kind of came out in Jeff's presentation. I think that's right, that, that philosophy is really his object. But, but Althusser's object is bourgeois philosophy, I think. OK, um, but before we look at how Derrida does this, I want to stress that this worry over this kind of equivocation isn't special to Althusser. Uh, but it's the problem of theory and practice uh, from a Marxist perspective. And I think this is what, if you're not really, you know, maybe you're not a Derrida scholar, not, you know, why, why should we worry about this? But I think Derrida's hitting now onto something that is a, a kind of fundamental element um, of a kind of Marxist position as such, at least when it comes to theory and practice. As T.W. Adorno puts it succinctly in his marginality of theory and practice, since its beginning, American pragmatism has been criticized with good reason for consecrating the existing conditions by making the practical applicability of knowledge its criteria for knowledge. The problem with all forms of pragmatism, American or otherwise, is that they determine the value of something relative to how it appears within certain social conditions. And they then take that specific assessment as the criterion of value more generally. Pragmatics confuses some specific conception of value for the nature of value as such. The practical applicability of knowledge under certain social conditions becomes the measure of value, uh, measure of knowledge in general. The practical applicability of value under certain social conditions becomes the measure of value itself. The, the result of this generalizing sleight of hand is that pragmatism naturalizes existing social conditions by making them the measure of social conditions in general. This is why, as Adorno notes, claims to pragmatism, pragmatism always tend to be reformist or reactionary insofar as they necessarily lack a real critique of the existing social order. Fantastic Adorno quote coming. Quote, the majority of actionists are humorless in a way that is no less alarming than those who laugh along with everyone. The lack of self-reflection derives not only from their psychology, it is the mark of praxis that, having become its own fetish, becomes a barricade to its own goals, end quote. Insofar as the actionist or the pragmatist accepts into their thinking the basic value structures of existing social relations, they become for Adorno constitutively unable to actually critique those very relations, replacing critique with humorless moralism or cliche platitudes. Althusser is leveling a similar critique against Marxist philosophers, including himself, whose failure to reject fully enough bourgeois philosophy's theory of knowledge leads them to naturalize the existing social conditions of bourgeois life. Right, that's what I take to be the claim. And I think to give a kind of Marxist account of what Derrida is up to, we need to understand the Marxist stakes of what Althusser is attempting to do. Now, he may fail to do it, but that's what he's attempting to do. And, and I think this puts Derrida's critique in a different light when we think of it in this way. Right, now there's lots we could say here. However, what I want to focus on is Althusser and Adorno's warning about the dangerous tendency towards the equivocation of the specific and the general, the confusing of bourgeois philosophy with philosophy as such, right? And I want to do this because it appears to me that Derrida himself engages in this very equivocation in his reading of theory and practice. Right? Okay, so uh, Derrida writes concerning the passage above this, pas this passage right here. This is Derrida's analysis of it. Quote, this note to elements of self-criticism would need to be read, would need to be studied very closely and I will, I'll content myself with simply reading it. It is not a self-critical note. What? It aims at philosophers who don't suspect the presence of law in philosophy itself. So for Derrida, this entire passage is not self-critical at all, right? It aims at philosophers in general. For Derrida, Althusser's account of the law and legal ideology of bourgeois philosophy is not a critique of bourgeois philosophy, but of philosophy itself. The force of this claim hangs on Derrida's odd assertion that this is not a piece of self-criticism, not a criticism of Marxist philosophers, but of philosophers in general, who, Derrida insists, fail for Althusser to, quote, suspect the presence of the law, generally understood, in philosophy itself. Now, while it is certainly the case that philosophers in general make an appearance in this passage, Althusser's Althusser critical of philosophers' blindness to the bourgeois nature of concepts, 
It is also equally clear that Althusser's target here is neither philosophers in general nor philosophy in general. It is not some universal thinking of law and legal ideology that concerns Althusser, but as outlined above, the way in which bourgeois philosophy comes to be naturalized as the very character of philosophy itself. It is, I think, difficult not to see in this reading a performance of the very equivocation Adorno and Althusser warn us against, Derrida generalizing a critique that ought to be read as specific. The risk of such a generalization is, as Adorno shows, the naturalization of bourgeois social forms, the confusing of bourgeois philosophy with philosophy itself. Now, given more time, I'd like to develop this point further, as this is not the only passage in which Derrida reads Althusser's, Althusser's critique of bourgeois philosophy as a critique of philosophy in general. And I think Jeff's exactly right that the entire analysis of theory and practice uh, for Derrida is really a question of philosophy and the edge of philosophy and what philosophy is doing. And I think there's a, there's a cost there from a Marxist perspective or a sort of odd element that I'm trying to bring to light. However, this is also not the only worrisome passage of Derrida's critique, I think, from a Marxist perspective. So Derrida is very critical throughout the lectures of what he sees as the tautological or circular nature of Althusser's approach. Speaking, for example, of Althusser's insistence on the preponderance of the practical, Derrida writes, quote, but Althusser says, and this is where what is defined intervenes in a circular manner in the very conditions of the definition, the theoretical problems and its solutions already exist. Where do they already exist? As practice as practical state, end quote. For Derrida, Althusser's assertion that all the theoretical problems and solutions he is working to develop already exist in the practical sphere smacks of contradiction, since if they already exist, then what exactly is Althusser's analysis itself doing? Moreover, Derrida worries, that what he see, what, worries about what he sees as Althusser's unwarranted prioritization of the practical over the theoretical. As Derrida writes, Quote, the fact that the theoretical produces knowledge that was already there in the practical state irreversibly marks the priority or primordiality of the practical over the theoretical, end quote. While Althusser's claim to the already there status of the practical appears to Derrida tautological or circular, and this kind of logic comes up over and over again, even if it is not, there is nonetheless in Althusser's thought the, an assertion of the priority of the practical over the theoretical, the assertion of the preponderance of practice. And I think this is fundamental to his critique of Althusser, in fact. What's strange about this claim is that while Derrida presents this assertion of the preponderance of the practical as a scandal in Althusser's account, or at least a problem, this kind of preponderance is a necessary element of any materialist philosophy. Since without such a claim, one is left either with the preponderance of the theoretical idealism or no preponderance between uh, theory and practice at all, which is to say an ontological or substance dualism. They're just separate. Where else does Derrida, where else does Derrida think theory could come from except from the objective sphere of the practical? And he clearly has to think that's the case. So it's, it's a strange critique, I think. Derrida is not blind to this need of materialist thought to posit the preponderance of the practical. As he writes in session five, quote, it isn't untrue, it isn't untrue. It isn't untrue that for every dialectical materialism, beings in general are determined in the last resort as matter, matter referred to as praxis. So what to do with this critique? Where does Derrida stand on the preponderance of the object? And I think this is absolutely crucial to understand where Derrida stands in relationship to Marxism, because I think any coherent Marxist position has to assert the preponderance of the objective or uh, over the, the subjective, right, in some sense. So, and, and I think this leads to a question to me about where he stands on the possibility of getting out of the theory practice divide, right? Um, so indication three, or uh, the third, third thing that I think should maybe raise worries. This issue of circularity or tautology is not unique to his critique of Althusser, emerging also in his critique of Heidegger and his account of the problematics of the lecture course as a whole. Summing up the central problematic of the course, Derrida writes, quote, you can be sure that each time you try to cross over the edge of the opposition theory and practice, you'll do it with a gesture that will sometimes be analogous to practice, sometimes to theory, and sometimes to both at once. That irreducible analogy is what impels me to pose the question of the edge. Each time there is overflow, it resembles what is overflowed. Overflowing remains in affinity with what is overflowed, 
offend, and I'll even say confined to what is overflowed. Having traced Althusser and Heidegger's attempt to rethink theory and practice, looking at the ways their thought again and again returns and repeats the structures and thinking they attempt to critique, or at least that's what I take him to be doing, we are for Derrida seemingly left with an inescapable logic of affinity that he has shown frustrates and confines the engagement with theory and practice. Every attempt to get out of the logic of theory and practice seems in the end to require that very distinction. This affinity between where we begin and where we end, a roadblock to our ability to get out of the circle as Althusser, Althusser would say. Moreover, it is this frustration and confinement, he suggests, that defines the very problematic of philosophy, at least a philosophy aimed at rethinking philosophy, aimed at articulating a new philosophy of practice, every attempt to break philosophy out of the dualism of theory and practice, returning the end to this dualism. Now, this can't be right, what I just said, right? Because Derrida is a thinker of radical possibility. But I think in lecture seven, and I'm gonna end here quickly with this, if you look at it in lecture seven, where he gives his own attempt to challenge the theory practice divide, uh, he changes his practice and then he decides it doesn't quite work and he goes back because the risks are for him too great. I think that the, the, that leaves questions about where he thinks, uh, our ability to get out of a, th a, a thinking of theory and practice, right? Um, now, what do all of these things, why, why do I care about these? The, the point is not to get an I got you moment with Derrida. The point to me is that when you read Derrida's theory and practice lectures, I think there are elements of it that seem to, to sort of ignore the Marxism that's going on in Althusser's account. And this is why so much of it, I think, is dedicated to Heidegger, maybe, which is that he's more interested in a kind of critique of theory and practice understood in a certain way as a philosophical problem than he is actually theory and practice understood as, uh, from a Marxist perspective. In any case, I think these three issues, this question of uh, uh, his um, uh, reading of it, uh, Althusser's critique of bourgeois philosophy as a uh, critique of philosophy in general, his, the question of where he stands on the preponderance of the object, and the question of how he views our ability to have a kind of thinking that would get out, transcend, challenge the theory praxis divide. Those are the places that uh, when I think need to be uh, um, analyzed more closely to sort of think about theory Dow's relationship to Marx. And I hope I've started that analysis. Thank you very much. All right, so thanks for these uh, really great papers and a really provocative set of questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask a couple questions that have been posed in, in Facebook, um, but I have a couple of big ones from, from my end as well. So hopefully we'll have time to get to, to all these different things. Um, one came, Jeff, while you were speaking. And, uh, I, but I believe that it's possibly something that you would want to respond to as well, Rick. It says, uh, does Derrida um, extend this critique of Althusser to Althusser's pessimistic response to the student uprisings of 68? And um, I, of course, I think that moment would be a place where we see kind of the, the explosion of practice, but also possibly some of the real concerns come to life. So, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and let you sort of respond to that historical question about the, the role of the, the events of 68 in this, this um, theoretical context. Rick, do you wanna take that first or? I, I mean, I could say a couple of things. I don't recall, and I don't think uh, Derrida goes into any detail about officer's response to May 68. Um, I would only say that, that May 68 would be a good example of um, practice getting out of control or practice being something that can't be uh, mastered or managed uh, by, by theory, um, which according to the account that I was really um, just in the, in the barest possible terms sketching out here would be something that you want to pay attention to, um, that kind of action that um, that that wasn't predicted in advance uh, and can't be um, might not even register as what it fully is within or through the lens of, of dominant theory, even if it's a theory of historical materialism or Althusser's theory. Um, Rick, would you like to add to that? Yeah. So I think. Uh, um, so 
I don't think theory does theory and praxis lectures are actually very much about Marxism or very much about Althusser in some ways, right? And one thing that's clear is that, for example, um, he really kind of ignores uh, the so, sort of self-critical element. I mean, Mindrin's it, right? But he kind of ignores the self-critical element of what Althusser is up to. He leaves out completely really any discussion of like, in, this is like 76, 77. So like what's going on in French Marxism at this time, right? You have you have this like, like kind of widespread critique of the Stalinism of French, commun uh, French, the French Communist Party. You have a kind of like challenging of the doctrinal commitments to the dictatorship of the proletariat. And a sort of you know general kind of attempt to rethink like we've been too dogmatic, so we need to be less dogmatic. Now, how successful you take those things to be? My point is that like I think that um, we need to be careful because I think those issues for Derrida aren't really central, um, and that then the question of sort of does he? I think he has then uh, actually a pretty pessimistic reading of Althusser as such. Um, in, in a way that I think actually is kind of problematic. I also think Althusser sort of gets a bad rap for being uh, not as careful as he is sometimes, especially in, in sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, Marxist circles, right? And I think let's take really seriously what Althusser's period of self-criticism is trying to do. And that's why I think that quote is so amazing is whether he succeeds or not, he sees himself as trying to unearth any kind of dogmatic element that is stopping him from sort of thinking the actual unfolding of the concept or to actually be as dialectical as possible. And that's something I think that, that we should be embracing. So yes, I think there's a pessimistic element and Derrida would actually have a pretty pessimistic reading about these areas, but I think we should kind of push back against that actually. So um, a second question that came up on Facebook was about the treatment of, of pragmatism and um, you know, obviously Adorno and the Frankfurt School have a very um, well worked out critique of pragmatism, but of course, I think the other side, many people feel that that's, um, and that's, this is the statement on Facebook, that it's a caricature. And so I wonder to what extent, you know, I mean, given if, if the feeling is that there's a caricature here of pragmatism that's unfairly uh, treating pragmatism, to what extent does pragmatism possibly offer then you know, um, a resource for theory and practice beyond this pair and this oppositionality, as well as the the superiority of theory over practice. Do either of you find pragmatism as something that could that could, you know, work from a political point of view, or do you kind of see that Adorno and and the Frankfurt School are are onto something in saying that pragmatism is always allied to the you know present social relations and broader condition that we find ourselves in. Should I take that one? Oh, I can just, I can start. Um, so I mentioned pragmatism. Um, Derrida notes that in, in the introduction to Four Marks, uh, there's a, he, he notes uh, he, that, that Althusser uh, marks a theoretical ambiguity in the 11th thesis, which leads to um, a kind of pragmatism, potentially leads to pragmatism. And uh, Althusser doesn't like that, so wants to research theory. And so, yeah, my mention of it was brief and, and definitely a caricature. Um, I think there are, okay, so I think my turn toward um, practice, uh, practices such as limits of subsistence agriculture in the global south uh, that are important to pay attention to because they, they aren't practices that show up uh, through the dominant theoretical lens or through the lens of techno-scientific mastery or calculative thinking. Uh, that, that could be interpreted as pointing toward pragmatism. I think uh, ultimately I am sympathetic with um, Althusser's uh, hesitation there, um, hesitation to say that uh, to, to um, sort of give too much authority to like whatever truth emer emerges out of practice. And again, I'm just going to operate in very you know caricaturist uh, terms. But. Uh, yeah, I think I, I'm actually um, so. Here's how I would here's how I would stage the problem, which is it, it's. I think the issue of whether you could develop a kind of like there's an element of pragmatism that's 
uh, useful, it's necessary for any sorts of uh, uh, sort of getting along in the world and getting things done, et cetera. Um, but I think that the we need to focus on what's the basic critique. And the question is not like, does everyone who call themselves a pragmatist, are they just wrong? The issue is, are, does your pragmatics, when you're approaching something pragmatically, does it read things with an eye towards what Marxists would call a kind of the totality? Or is that critique of pragmatism, or is that practical um, initiative housed within a greater critique of the system as a whole, right? Um, and I think that's what I take critical theory to be pointing to. That's what I take uh, Althusser to be kind of warning us against, that there's nothing wrong with like pragmatism as an element of social critique, but pragmatism taken as the guide for all social critique, uh, that's going to get us into trouble very quickly, at least on their accounts. And I'm sympathetic to that problematic, right? Um, and so I, I think there it's like the, the difference between uh, sort of taking the, the, you know, I use flashcards and I read a text and that's how I learn French. It's mistaking the flashcards in the text for learning French. And those are two different things, I think. So as long as we keep those separate, you could still have pragmatism as an element of social critique without a problem. Sure. I think, um, you know, this to me anyway, kind of transitions a little bit to the questions that I, one or, or one or two of the questions that I had personally, and maybe we only have time for one of them, but the, the you know, the issue that you returned over and over to, Rick, and I think it's something, Jeff, that, that is um, at least contained within your, your reading, is this question of the, the, the way that Derrida reads um, Althusser, so to speak, as symptomatic of the whole of philosophy. And so then there's this question, I guess, and this goes, this, the reason I said there's a transition here is the question of totality. Um, to, it, it, you know, I think you're, Rick, you're, you said that we got the difference between bourgeois philosophy versus philosophy as such. And there's a sort of consistent slippage between the part here or the instance and the whole or the universal. And so I wonder if you can unfold that a little bit more and, uh, you know, to something that I might sort of speak of on behalf of Jeff or, or at least, you know, to give, you know, Derrida some ammo to come to respond to something you might say would be the thought that, well, be that as it may, um, you know, to some extent, bourgeois philosophy is determined by this sort of historical legacy. And so, you know, it's in its categories, for example, may be legal categories, but those legal categories are already sort of metaphysical in some way. So I'll stop there and, and see what you think about that and hear your thoughts. Yeah, so just to say really quick, oh, Jeff, did you wanna go first? Are you sure? Okay. Um, I, I, th I think that, um, I want to be clear. Like, I think that uh, I am, you know, this is not meant to be a, a sort of, you know, overarching critique of, of Derrida necessarily. I think there are real problems with, like, my reading would be hard to square with other elements of, or my suppositions would be hard to square with some other elements of Derrida's text. And, and I'm interested in sort of trying to work that out. But I do think, um, my theory is that I think if you watch how the analogy of the lecture course works, uh, Derrida's critique works really well on Heidegger. Uh, because Heidegger is actually searching, I think, for a kind of origin. And that's how Derrida often critiques his opponents. You're searching for an origin. I'm going to show you how that search for an origin is actually problematic, and you can't have the origin that you're actually trying to sort of unearth, right? Um, and he has several lines where he says, you know, uh, Heidegger always challenges the notion of truth with a more fundamental truth, the notion of reality with a more fundamental notion of reality. The problem is I think that doesn't work. That, that may even be a good critique of Althusser in mind. I'm not an Althusser scholar, right? But that's not a good critique of Marxism because Marxism isn't about trying to find the origin. You, you, the, the point is to understand the appearance in front of us. And to do that, we have to do all this theoretical work, but we never got behind it or something. We were always at the level of, of the appearance in some way, right? And my, my supposition is that that's an idea that Derrida has trouble being sympathetic to, right, is how I would put it. Um, and so I think there's lots, if, if there's lots about Derrida's analysis that is, it, there, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking the track he does. We want to aim at, think about theory and practice and philosophy. That's all fantastic. I just think 
if you characterize a Marxist position as trying to get to an origin, to get back behind, to get to some root, that's not a good way to think about what a consistent or a, a kind of true, true Marxist position would be interested in doing, right? Um, and I suspect he's sort of reading out these air and therefore Marxism by extension in that way. And I think that's a problem. So um, I think just before I lose the thread on the question of the origin, I, I think a Derridian response would look something like, well, he's not accusing Althusser of trying to get back to anything, but he's noting that there is this homology in the way that Althusser uh, asserts um, theory uh, and, and sort of posits theory as uh, the, sovereign adjudicator of what counts as philosophy uh, or as dialectical materialist philosophy. Uh, and and the, that's homologous with, say, the way in which Aristotle establishes theory over the, the priority theory or over practice or the way in which, um, yeah, Aristotle understands the sort of sovereignty of the unmoved mover uh, as the pinnacle and consummation of theory, of theory uh, or, or theoretical activity. Um, so in that sense, there's still kind of a unified origin. Now that's complicated by the self-critical aspect of the dialectic in all this rhetoric that you mentioned before, which I think is really important. And I agree that Derrida tends to run roughshod over that. Um, and, I think, and I think that does have to do with this question of the totality as well. I mean, I think for me, there, there's something very similar to the self-critical uh, aspect uh, of the kind of circular dialectic uh, in Althusser uh, and you know the critical uh, self-critical tools that you get from critical other aspects of critical theory um, I think there are probably you know tools for self-criticism and ideology critique you can get out of the pragmatist tradition to call back to that um, I think all that's important then for me it becomes a question of the difference between all of that stuff and deconstruction uh, or maybe there's not, I mean, it's a, just a different orientation. I think there's a kind of self-criticism that's going on in deconstruction as well. I think in terms of the question of totality, for me, it comes down to how, how Derrida poses the question of totality. I think that's different um, than, than how he's accusing Heidegger of posing it. Um, so I think, yeah, he does slide between uh, doing a deconstructive reading of Althusser and using Althusser as a cipher for uh, a dominant tendency in the history of philosophy. Uh, I think that sliding is there, uh, but I think he would say that it's justified uh, insofar as the deconstructive reading is opening up Althusser's text as well as the text of the history of philosophy to a non-totality, to a radically open field of possibilities, um, whereas the Garian gesture would close it down, uh, would, would claim to, right, master the totality of metaphysics. So, you know, in order to set it aside and get back to the true origin. So I think it's this future oriented opening up of, uh, of um, yeah, a field of, uh, of unmasterable possibilities. It's the gesture I find in deconstruction that I find that I find really promising. That's maybe a little bit different than the, the way, the kinds of self-criticism you get in other traditions. Um, so, if, if you're all okay with it, I think we're, we're, we're running close to time, but I have several questions coming in. Like Facebook just uh, decided that it was very interested in what we're up to here. Um, so I think if it's okay with you, we can run a few minutes over just in order to address some of these questions that are coming in on Facebook, which I think are very good questions. Um, and, and one takes us, it leaves off just actually where you were, Jeff. And so, but I think it's it's useful to kind of take us back to, and I'm going to add my own twist on it as well. So it says, is there a point where theory informs practice and where practice informs theory? And is this point outside or beyond both? Uh, does it emerge from or overflow this dichotomy? And, you know, one of the things that you both noted frequently was this image of overflowing the edge. And I wonder if, you know, so in one sense, that sounds like a problem, like it's a kind of critique, right? That it can't do this, that it can't limit itself or it can't create its own boundary. But in another way, what one could reframe that as a positive thing, that is to say that, that neither practice nor theory can actually set itself up independently of the other. So um, with that, I, I will turn it over to you both to sort of address that question. 
uh, Jeff, I think you're on mute. To pick it up really quickly from where uh, I, I left off, I think that but the, the thing, the gesture uh, in sort of Derridian deconstruction that I find promising uh, is the gesture toward that, that, that works through a theory or a text uh, in order to, to open it up, to deconstruct it and open it up, uh, to, to let something else in, to open it onto alterity. Uh, so in that regard, right, I don't, I don't think there's any, any pure theory uh, that, that can inform practice or, or, or any uh, um, pure practice uh, that can, that's going to uh, be the sort of source of, of theory in the sense that it's the most worthy thing to think. Um, I think it's always going to be, the, the two are always going to be intermeshed. Um, but I think what, what deconstruction can do is sort of open up the dominant understanding uh, of, of practice uh, in order to allow practices that don't show up uh, according to the dominant criteria uh, to show up uh, and to be taken um, seriously by, by thinking. And I, and I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I, how I would pose it, and this is what I was trying to get with this preponderance of the object or the preponderance of practice question a little bit is how does Derrida conceive the relationship between theory and practice? And it seems pretty clear to me that he thinks something like what, what Jeff just said. That is, he would never say it's theory over praxis or praxis, practice over theory, right? He wants some combination of the two, right? Um, my question is, what does that combination of the two look like for him? And my supposition would be, given what he says in the text, is that he thinks the identity of theory and practice, as I think he's suspicious of that, and he's suspicious of it because he thinks of it as what you're saying is theory and practice at the same time, in the same way, in equal amounts, or something like that, right? And this is why I think he, the question of the preponderance of the object is so important, because what a person like Adorno would say, or a Marxist, I think, position would say is, yes, there's a preponderance of the objective or of practice over theory in the sense that ideas come from the world, right? But they're always in unity. And so you're thinking a unity, but never a unity in which the, the, there would be just a kind of an identity between them in some simple way. And my worry is, and I, this is an open question for me, how does Derrida think this relationship in these lectures and in general? And my suspicion is that Derrida is, is so worried about that tendency towards identity and the sort of what he sees, I think, as the dangerous elements of that, that that causes him to, I think, sometimes I, I don't see places in the text where I see him thinking the preponderance of the object in its identity with or the preponderance of practice in its identity with theory um, that clearly, right? And that seems to me to be A, a Marxist position. So that's interesting if you're a Marxist, I think. But two, um, then I wonder about, and this is where we get into some, I think, interesting questions of, of it, how is he then thinking the relationship of theory and practice? How is that relationship to theory and practice taking on the dominant model versus critiquing the dominant model, right? That is a sort of, uh, uh, kind of more problematic relationship. And those are open questions for me, but that's how I would pose it, that I think you have to think it as ideas come from the world and yet they're always in unity. And where is that in Derrida's thought would be the question, to my mind. So that's very interesting. And I think, um, so you both brought up questions of identity and, and, and by at least implication in, in your case, uh, Rick, alterity. Um, I will note one of the comments on uh, Facebook um, is that there's a feeling that D Derrida is the more politically hopeful person between the two and offers, uh, you know, a, a frame of critique that is about, you know, creating space for possibility and alterity, whereas Althusser comes off as the more politically pessimistic and you know, I don't know whether that's necessarily a bad thing. The, the person who authored this says that's obviously a simplistic way of dividing the two, but do you, do you share this suspicion? And I guess then the question we might relate to it is from a, and, and you know, this is sort of an, an interesting double folding, I guess, of our, of our folding in upon itself of our question, but from a practical point of view, right? Uh, who, who might we see as more politically useful and significant around these questions of uh, hope? After you, Jeff. You're you're muted again, Jeff. 
Jeff, you're muted again. There we go. I think this is a very challenging question and there are lots of reasons for political pessimism right now. Um, but yeah, I, do, I agree that, that Derrida is the most, the more, the more hopeful thinker. One of his like last published pieces, at least in translation, was a piece on, on hope. Um, and um, yeah. yeah, so I think that's, that's right. And I think you see that in the notion of the avenir uh, and the quasi-transcendental, the orientation of the quasi-transcendental to come. Um, and, and this idea of an opening uh, onto alterity, opening of dominant systems of thought and action onto uh, becoming otherwise. Um, and so I, I think there's something affirming uh, in, in that gesture, um, but there are lots of reasons to be pessimistic. Um, so I, I think that's, I mean, I, I, I think definitely Jerry does a thinker of radical hope, right? Um, and I mean, I think he's, uh, what he says, and I haven't, don't quote me on this, but in Spectres of Marx, I'm pretty sure what he says that he wants to take from Marxism most is it sort of like uh, kind of revolutionary uh, possibilities or kind of revolutionary uh, sort of thinking that the world could be otherwise, right? That's, the, that's what's akin in deconstruction and Marxism for him kind of most fundamentally. Um, I think that we should be careful though, because as someone who also works on Adorno, who always gets accused of being pessimistic, I think that this, this hits to this pessimism optimism thing comes back in some ways to this question of uh, whether like pessimistic or optimistic under what conditions. So I think that often thinkers and Althusser might also suffer from this, but if we take seriously the idea that everything has to be read that we're talking about as yes, philosophy or hope or optimism under certain conditions, it's not just as such, then it changes entirely how you read claims that are being made by thinkers, right? So when Adorno says thought, you know, uh, subsumes its object, right? Under these conditions, that, that, that can never mean thought does it just and can't stop doing it and will always treat its object badly. It has to mean it only happens under certain conditions. And that's the part of, um, that's the part of Marxism that for me, I want to hang on the most, hang on to the most, because that's the part that stops us. I think that's what Althusser worries, that the bourgeois trap of traps is when we start thinking we can't get out. It's when we start thinking that there is no hope. And so obviously, uh, I think Theory I would affirm that and would be a thinker of hope. My question would be how he sets up some of his, what kind of hope or optimism do we get, given how he sets up some of his worries about the kind of metaphysical questions that are going on here. And I think it might turn out that Derrida is actually, um, and this is not a surprising claim, that he is a liberal in some fundamental ways, um, and then I think we get into some questions that would relate to our political present, which is the sort of claims around the hope in Biden or the hope in Sanders or these kinds of questions of like hope in what context. Um, and then I think the, the liberal and the Marxist is going to have a remarkably different reading of, of how we understand our political presence and its possibility. And they're going to break in some ways along some of the questions that we're asking, I think. So a final. Can I, um, can I just ahead, say with some one quick um, follow up? Yeah. So I, I, uh, a lot of that resonates with me, and I think in terms of like political uh, usefulness, uh, I think maybe it's a difference in um, like where you get normativity, where you get a kind of normative imperative or a, an imperative to respond to an unconditional claim, uh, or the motif that goes throughout theory and practice. What must be done. And I think like, I'm very sympathetic to the Althusserian move uh, that wants to assert uh, theory, uh, right? even uh, building a lot of self-criticism to that assertion, but assert theory uh, to, to sort of um, adjudicate what practices uh, need to be taken up into uh, the theory and need to, um, need to be thought along dialectical materialist lines. Uh, because, I mean, this goes back to the critique of pragmatism, like you don't want to just say, you know, any, whatever happens, you know, is praxis, and that's where thought should um, get its, its norm or get its, its impetus for making the world otherwise. I mean, you know, January 6th is a great example of, what, you know, some a, a practice that we don't want to follow. Uh, so that kind of normativity uh, of, 
uh, that, that's imminent to critique, uh, I think that you might also get in certain thinkers in critical, in critical theory, uh, I think is, is, is important. And you don't get that in Derrida. You don't in fact get that in deconstruction. I think you do get you know, in deconstruction a, a kind of normative more normativity or a kind of imperative to respond to unconditional claim through this opening onto alterity. Uh, but that's also fragile and, and dangerous because it could be whatever. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not really coming down on either side. I'm just seeing sort of uh, the, the advantages, the political advantages of both approaches and disadvantages. So it's possible that I'm shoehorning you into um, a previous debate that you A, weren't part of. And so, so that, I apologize for that. But if I may, one thought that I had, um, you know, last in our last, um, last talks, we talked about this question of responding to climate change. And, you know, um, in, in both cases, uh, we saw kind of a very, an emphasis in fact on, you know, totality sort of uh, massive state-based intervention as fundamentally politically necessary and, and as moving us beyond a certain impasse in, in left thinking. Now, one of the interesting things I noted here from, from, your, from what you've written, Jeff, is uh, you know, this, this emphasis on these subsistence agricultural practices, right? So uh, there's a kind of eco-feminist gesture there I can, I can gather. And I, I wonder then, you know, do, do we, looking at these questions in the, in, with the urgency that we have to, and thinking about this question of totality, you know, how do we sort of adjudicate these two sides where one is looking for alternative practices um, in many spaces, but obviously practices that are possibly not rep that we can't replicate in the short term, right? That, that provides political inspiration, but certainly can't be political models versus the necessity of our moment, which requires um, change on, a, on an unprecedented um, and almost unthinkable scale. So I don't know if, if that's beyond what you, you you could possibly respond to in the terms of your presentation, but it certainly made me think about this. Um, yeah, so the gesture to Trish Glazebrook's work at the end um, is you know, a gesture that I also try to make and develop at greater length in, in a project on philosophical responses to climate change. Um, and I do think that uh, it's the, it, it is a char characteristic or signature gesture of this more Heideggerian, Derridian, post-phenomenological deconstructive approach uh, that wants to dismantle uh, dominant systems, loosening them up, loosening up the ways in which they dominate in order to invite uh, suppressed perspectives, suppressed practices uh, in, uh, in order to transform um, systems of thinking and acting uh, in that way. Um, so that's probably incrementalist and that's probably not gonna move fast enough. I'm sympathetic to that gesture, um, but I'm, I'm also sympathetic to the claim that, uh, that things need to move faster but I think you know that that poses its own political challenges. Uh, so the question, uh, I mean, so in the meantime, inviting different perspectives into, say, uh, policy making, um, uh, taking uh, uh, women from the global south uh, perspectives seriously, right, at the highest levels of policy making in like, e e or in uh, in in climate summits, and uh, in in taking that perspective into account uh, in in policymaking as Glazebrook advocates, I think is like a way of shifting uh, the, the horizon of the possible so that a more radical response uh, might actually take purchase. But it's, it's insufficient in and of itself. I, I just wanted to add that, I, I think that when we, when, you know, the, the analysis of climate change has to be put in the context of a critique of capitalism. I think you just can't understand those. In which case then, I think that my only, it's like, it's like one of these things like the, the, 
this question has to be framed in a certain kind of way. And I think what often ends up getting, getting uh, how this often gets framed um, is in terms of uh, a kind of, you know, you know, getting alternative practices or, up, uh, you know, being more democratic or more egalitarian and all of those things, like, that's, those are good things. But egalitarianism understood in what sense? More open practices understood in what sense? And if those aren't anti-capitalist senses, I think then, in some sense, you, you end up with part of this problem of kind of polishing the brass on the Titanic uh, kind of moment, right? And that actually what I think what radical politics ought to be taking the position of is uh, something much more I mean, lots of people are doing this, but I mean, like the insistence, and this goes back to reading the totality, the insistence that all of this has to be read in terms of, of uh, letting practices in that are anti-capitalist. Um, and that as, as, if we're not doing that, then I don't, I, I'm, I feel like it's not only not fast enough, but it will be inadequate, right? I think the Marxist position has to be something like that. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think one thing that's important to note is that the, the the, the hegemonic system of thinking uh, or conception of thinking and acting uh, that suppresses the perspective of subsistence farmers, for example, is because they're way below the radar of capital. Uh, and so introducing those perspectives, I think is an, it's an anti-capitalist move. Um, well, uh, unfortunately I hate to cut this short, or although we're now quite over time, um, but I think we're going to have to do that for reasons of time. But I do, I think this was a really provocative and interesting uh, set of talks. So thank you so much, both of you, uh, Jeff and Rick. We really greatly appreciate your time and your thoughts. Thank you so much for hosting. Thanks so much.